Hello again. So today I'm going to cover chapter 16, uh, chapter 19, which is in lecture 16 of the course. And the lecture talks about routing in packet switched networks. So, um, in previous lectures, we talked about the concept of intermediate nodes we talked about intermediate nodes that reside between um, the source and destination any two communicating nodes right? unless we have a direct connection we have something in between and that something in between could be uh, we talked about bridges we talked about hubs we talked about routers briefly right and all of these intermediate nodes, they their job is to forward packets or frames, right? To forward them from the source to the destination. And I mentioned at some point that they are all form of multiplexers. They take inputs, multiple uh, frames from multiple inputs, and they forward them to also multiple outputs, right? So this is how uh, information travel across the network. Uh, all of these intermediate nodes share one job, which is forwarding frames, right? And we talked about sometimes we forward frames with information about layer two, layer two information only, right? So a bridge or a switch uses layer two information only. It needs just a Mac address source and destinations if we go below that if we go to um, something like a hub the hub actually doesn't it works only on the physical layer doesn't it doesn't look into any um, information from the upper layers right so if you go up to the router the router uses information from layer 3 which is the IP layer in the TCP IP stack or network layers in the OS, OSI model in general, right? So each one of these devices uses certain information but in a certain layer, but they all share the same job, which is forwarding frames. Okay. Um, in the textbook, we have several criteria or several you know um, I guess requirements about how this how this forwarding happen right we need something that's stable we need something that's consistent we need something that's reliable all of that right but um, in routing one of the most important performance criteria is to select routes that minimizes the travel time or or they or if i want to make it general i would say we want to minimize the cost right minimize the cost of travel from one point to another from the source to the destination the issue here is what is what do we mean by cost right so what it is it dollars do, dollar amount or i mean cost in terms of money or another we use another another term we use the the cost in general to represent either the minimum number of hops minimum number of jumps right or the cost could be the least uh, or representing delay so when we say the least cost we mean the least delay right or sometimes if the cost is the number of jumps so the least cost means the minimum number of jumps in the network so in this example we see that if i consider the cost to be the number of hops then any uh, packets or frames traveling from one to six uh, the least number of hops 
in that case is 1, 2, 3, and then 3, 2, 6, right? That's the least number of jumps. Any other path will cause us to go more jumps. But what if the jump from 1 to 3 is expensive, is actually based on other criteria like uh, delay? It takes it takes a long time to go from one to three and it takes much shorter time to go through another route then in that case we would consider the cost to be a different criteria for example delay and here we consider one four five six is the least cost if you look at these numbers in the slide you see that they represent a cost factor right and again the cost could be delay right or bandwidth or any other metric we'll talk about later so in that case if you add up the travel from 1 to 3 then from 3 to 6 you'll find that it will actually cost 5 plus 5 10 units of cost right if that's if the cost here is delay and the delay is given by milliseconds then this is 10 milliseconds but if we go from 1 to 4 4 to 5 5 to 6 then we add up the cost the cost from 1 to 4 is 1 and from 4 to 5 is 1 and from the 5 to 6 is 2 so the total cost is 4 right and if, again, if the cost is actually milliseconds, then four milliseconds to travel. So we may choose a different path based on that. So although the slide will give you two options based on minimum number of hops or based on the least cost. And actually, I would say that both of them are based on least cost, right? It's just the cost in the previous, in the, in the, in the, uh, first option the cost is calculated as the number of hops while in the second option the cost is based on another criteria like delay right so it's always the least cost it's just what we mean by the cost is 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 different and I'm, i'll revisit this topic when we talk about uh, distance vector protocols so um, if we focus on routing in at layer three right just now we're not going to talk about other uh other layers just layer three um then um we have another criteria to measure the performance is where the decision happened where what when right we talked about the here is how how we select the route right here is when to select the route so we could select the route um, it, before we send any packets right so before we send any packets we pick the route we saw that in previous lectures when we talked about circuit switching and virtual circuit switching right so in both cases, before we send any packet or any data in general, we select the route during the circuit setup, right? And we also talked about, when we talked about datagram or packet switching, is the, the decision of selecting the route happens when the packet is received by the router. So when the router receives the packet, that's when it looks at the destination address and decides, okay, based on this de destination, I'm going to forward it to this route or this route or that route. Right? So again, we have two criteria here, depends on time. It's either before sending any packets or every time we send a packet, the decision has to be made. All right, another criteria is the decision place. Where do we decide? So 
we can decide based on three different criteria we can decide in a distributed fashion so when I mentioned talking about the roots um, or in the packets we could decide every time we hit or the packet hits one of these routers the router decides where to forward it so the place of the decision is these routers right another criteria is centralized so the decision made by a central controller by central location the centralized location is the one that decides where to forward the packets so not the individual routers but in a centralized controller finally the last place to make a decision is actually the source itself so we have a technique called source routing where the source says i want this frame or i want to send this packet to be forwarded through this path so the source decides where to send the information right right so we looked at the time the the how so how we make the decision about routing based on minimum cost how we or when to make the decision it's either before we send any packets or at the time each packet needs to be forwarded that's when we make the decision and finally the place of the decision it could be distributed so each one of those intermediate nodes make the decision or could be centralized so one controller in the entire networks makes all the decisions or at the source so the source decides i want my packets to be forwarded this way so we have here routing strategies so these are so we talked about all of the criteria but what is the strategy that we use so we have four as the slide says either the strategy will be fixed or flooding random or adaptive so let's take a look at each one of these so what do we mean by fixed so fixed means that we make the decision about where to forward this or how to forward these packets in a fixed manner that it doesn't care about how the topology changes or how the network changes we just make a decision manually probably right so the slide gives us an example by an administrator for example or an algorithm that makes this decision once right so it looks at the information available in the network and says all right so i'm gonna build my routing strategy here or routing directory uh, in a in a table like this and the table will explain how each packet is forwarded so in this particular example we see that if i want to forward packets from node 4 at the top here to node 6 at the column here so I have to send my packet to 5 so 4 wants to send traffic to 6 well it has multiple options it can send to 3 first and then 6 it can send to 5 and then 6 it can send to 1 and 1 to 3 and 3 to 6 right all of these are possible routes but if I want to take a look at the least cost I would say that the least cost here is from two to six because it will cost us only two units right? take a look at another example here where i want to forward packet from one to six 
so one is the top and six here to the left so you see here that to send a packet from one to six I have to forward to four first so one two six now a router one receives information receives a packet and wants to forward it to six it looks up this table and say okay I'm gonna send it to four first right? and then forget about it so that's it the router doesn't really care about the rest of the route I just want to I have a packet that has a destination six I'm just gonna forward it to four four looks at the packet and say I want to forward the packet to six so this means that I have to send it to five so it will send it to five five looks at this packet again and say okay to send the packet to six six is my neighbor so I'm gonna send it to six directly okay. so each packet here or e um, each router will just send the packet to the next hub according to this table uh, without really caring about the rest of the path and I probably mentioned something wrong in the, in the beginning so if 4 wants to send something to 6 as I said I think probably I said it right or maybe I said it wrong I don't remember but you see here I can send it from 4 to 5 then 5 to 6 or I can send it from 4 to 3 and from 3 to 6 or from 4 to 1, 1 to 3 and 3 to 6 all of these are possible paths so here the table says I can send it to 5 if I want to send something to 6 I'll send it to 5 so 4 will send it to 5 and then 5 will take care of it and send it the rest of the path to 6 why don't we always send it to the next to the neighbor right so look at this example n1 is neighbor to n3 but if you look at this table you see if I want to send something from 1 to 3 I have to forward it to 4 first and then 4 send it to 5 and then 5 send it to 3 so instead of sending it directly it goes this way why because the cost here the, the criteria that we used is the least cost and the least cost is 1 to 4, 4 to 5, and 5 to 3, right? Okay, um, you will see here that the administrator, after building this routing table, it just gives each node its, por its portion of it. It doesn't necessarily give the whole thing to every node, but it will just slice this big table and gives each node uh, only a portion that it's concerning that node so node one is given this table it says that if you want if you have something for node two send it directly to node two if you have something to node three send it first to node four and so on you notice here that from node one perspective um most of the packets would be forwarded to node 4 right node 4 has options if it wants to send something to node 1 and one, node 2 it can choose node 2 as an intermediate step for everything else it chooses node 5 as intermediate step so the point here is this this strategy is fixed it's given to the nodes probably by configuration from the administrator right and the nodes will act upon it for forever unless the administrator comes back and change the configuration obviously this is an uh, inexpensive strategy why because it doesn't require any complex algorithm to calculate the cost somebody probably do it manually and we'll just put this in the network
we see this in today's network but we call them static routes right so we can the administrator can go and put a static route in the configuration says that if you want to uh, if you want to send a packet to network a go through this next hub so if this is fixed and based on the administrator configuration so i can build my uh, routing this way another strategy is flooding so flooding means when the packet is received by a router the router will take will send it to all other links so if the router has let's say router 4 has four links and if it receives a packet from n2 it sends the packet in all other nodes so it will send it to node 1 it will send it to node 3 it will send it to node 5 right um, so it floods it and notice here that by the way each link is represented by two lines one for each direction and in theory in theory the cost for each direction could be different right so if if uh, it depends on the criteria if we're looking at delay for example propagation delay as a metric there is no difference between one direction or the other but if we consider at congestion for example the number of packets that travel then it is possible that we have a different cost for each direction so in general we are representing the links here and the cost as different in each but that's not how flooding works i'm just uh, uh, revisiting an old topic here flooding says i receive a packet from one link i'm just gonna send it to all other links as simple as that we saw this strategy before actually just on a different layer we saw it when we talked about bridging okay. so bridges work initially by if I, it, they don't under, they don't know where the destination is so they flood the traffic and then later when they fill their mac table they will stop flooding because they will know the destination each destination which port uh, they should send it to so flooding is a strategy that's is it was used also at layer 2 with the bridges okay is it a good strategy well obviously it has some disadvantages we could see the disadvantage here when we look at this picture so node one wants to send the packet so it floods it in all other links then if you look at each one of these routers router 2 sees the packet so it floods it into two other links router 3 sees the packet so it floods it into four other links 4 here sees the packet so it floods it into into another three links and by the time 5 sees it and each one of these nodes sees it again coming from the other side so the one link or the one packet that came to router 1 became all of these packets so obviously duplication is a major problem with flooding all right so um how can we avoid the duplication well one technique is um we associate each packet with a number so when a node receives a packet twice it knows that the packet is duplicate so two here receives the packet right and then forwards it but it receives this packet two same packet from three it goes to two again so this one and this one they will have the same number so two looks at the packet that came from the other side and say well i have seen this packet before it came from one and now it's coming from three 
so I'm not gonna send it again I already seen it before so I'm not gonna send it all right this is one strategy to avoid these duplicates another strategy is to attach each packet with an with a um, uh, the maximum number of duplicates that can have so we we have like a hub count or any number that says well every time a router receives a packet it decrements that number and then so let's say the initial number is five so when router one sends the packet it will send it with number five or the source actually the source sends the packet with number five as the maximum hub count so okay one sends it decrement the number of uh, hubs to by one so it becomes four and sends it to two two decrements the number of hubs by one so now the number of hubs is three and sends the packet to all other nodes three sees the packet so it uh, decrements the number of hops by one so now the number of hops mm -hmm. became two and sends the packet to six and five so every router decrements the number of hops now if two sees the packet coming back to it it may continue to flood it up to a point where the number of hops becomes zero so if the number of hops becomes zero it doesn't flood the packet anymore it says that's now you exceeded um, the number the maximum number of hops you can travel so i'm gonna drop so in that case a packet started from one goes to three goes to two goes to one again goes to four and dies right or goes to three four and one and dies because we exceeded the number of hops so this is another strategy uh, that it allows the duplicates but eventually the duplicates will die out because each one of these packets has a maximum number of hops to travel so we can adjust the number of hops manually saying the network is this size right so we could the maximum travel time between any two nodes is three or let's say four so we could say well the packet cannot go more than four hops or three hops actually so the packet will be duplicated duplicated we guarantee that it will reach six here because the number of hops is three so we guarantee that will reach six but then any extra hops or any extra travel time will be eliminated because the packet will be um, discarded after that we have seen actually briefly this strategy used if you remember when we talked about the ip header we have a field called time to live ttl and that is exactly what we use it for we use it to eliminate any problem in the network that that will cause the packet to be duplicated and duplicated so even if we even if there is a problem in the network that causes the packet to be duplicated we ultimately drop the packet if it travels more than the number of hops in the TTL and it depends on the operating system some operating system set the number of hops to 64 some others set the number of hops to 255 which is the maximum so it, it really depends on the source the source set the the, the number of hops so we talked about disadvantages of flooding what are the advantages the advantages actually it's very robust which means that it guarantees that the packet will reach the destination no matter what if we drop a packet if we send a packet to two 
regardless of where the destination is we guarantee that it will reach why because the, it will the the network will duplicate the packets will duplicate the packets and they will travel everywhere until they reach the destination even if we don't know what the destination is or where where it is right and that's why that's why bridges using it um so we could now obviously the duplicates not ideal when we send data packets but we could use it temporarily for for certain purposes for example if i want to establish a virtual circuit between two nodes across the network but i don't know how to forward the initial packet so i could just simply flood it at first so we could flood the network we could flood the packet so if i want to if i want to send my um if there is a node here and a node here and i want to send or i want to actually establish a vir virtual circuit between a and b here so i could send a packet to one router one router one will forward it flood it to all other nodes and it will go around the entire network and it will be duplicated so eventually it will reach b b will receive packets different packets from this route from this route and each one will be actually more packets because some packets will be duplicated from other routes as well b could look at these packets and say well this packet here traveled through five and then through uh, three and five another packet traveled through this path another packet traveled through this path here right so i could pick the packet that arrived the first one for example the sooner the the quickest one right and say well this is the one this is the packet or the route uh, um, that this packet has traveled i'm gonna use it to set up my circuit so packets of course this one traveled the longest because it has lots of delay here so it will arrive probably late but this one here traveled quicker so the pack b will choose to establish a circuit through this route and this will be the virtual circuit so it sends its acknowledgement through this route to a and telling a that all right from now on send all of your packets through this route one to four four to five five to six right. so this could be a useful strategy to um, flood first and then based on the information that the destination receives it will decide it will decide uh, which um, which routers will participate in the virtual circuit right now for order to this to happen we have to include information about the packet we cannot just send packets and that's it no um, we have to add piece of information so that every time a packet travels the router uh, n1 for example has to put its number in it so it says this packet traveled to router one so when the packet is received by router two 
it has to include add one which is the router the first router and its own number two and then router three sees the packet so it puts its own number as well so every packet is traveling it will add its own number so b sees the the packet and say okay this packet came from a but it traveled through one two three this packet came from a also but it traveled through one four five and six this packet came from a but it traveled through one two four three right so it took a different route so I'm gonna pick the one that traveled the shortest distance the least cost and I will inform the routers on the path to form a virtual circuit right. so we could use this technique to achieve this uh, virtual circuit so this is an example of using flooding only for a specific purpose another use of flooding is actually if the routers want to share information among themselves then they use flooding we'll see later when we talk about adaptive routing routers need to exchange information so each router will tell other routers oh i have access to this network and that network so in order to share they have to flood each other information right also we talked about um, bridges as well so i keep visiting the bridges because the concept is applicable to bridges as well just we are talking about different layers so when we talked about bridges we talked about spanning tree protocol and with spanning tree protocol also the bridges exchange information among themselves so they use flooding as well so each bridge will send information to all bridges that it's surrounding it and the bridge will receive the information and flood it to all other bridges that it has access to and so on and so forth until the entire network knows about all the bridges and then they form a spanning tree right so same concept happening in multiple layers and that's why we're calling this routing strategy there is a difference between the strategy and the protocol so protocols happen in different layers but the strategies or the concepts could be applicable to multiple protocols another strategy is random random routing so with random random routing we don't keep information about um, or exchange information so every router decides how to forward packets based on simple criteria i have multiple links so so n2 for example has three links so it can say okay three links so each link i'm gonna send a packet to it using a random probability of third one third so i'll take a packet look at it and say okay i'm gonna throw it to n3 another packet comes look at it and say okay i'm gonna throw it to n1 so randomly of course randomly means that some packets will be traveling to the n3 two or two packets in a row so it's we don't really uh say uh three then four then one then three then four then one that's a different strategy that's what we call it a round robin strategy but if i pick one of these links at random then it's a random strategy i could improve the random strategy a little bit by looking at the delay and say well travel to n3 cost three units of delay or three units of cost in general travel to four cost me two and travel to one cost me three so 
I could say that because of this has a lower delay so I'm gonna give it a higher probability so even though I am still sending packets at random but I will give this link a higher pro higher pro probability so that more links will travel to it slightly more right? um, I could also use bandwidth so if I have um, let's say the bandwidth here is one the bandwidth here is two the bandwidth here is also one so this means that I can send half of my so the priority here is two over four or half so I'm gonna send half of my packets through this link and one quarter of this packet through this link and one quarter of this packet so how did I do that by saying uh, the bandwidth divided by the total bandwidth so I have 2 over 4 here in the link to 4 and 1 over 4 1 over 4 and the other two links right so it's still probability but it considers either delay or bandwidth in calculating the probability as I said if I pick the links like go in around Robin so pick the first second third then first second third the first second third then we will do what's called around Robin routing right? the advantage of this strategy is I don't really need to know anything about the rest of the network so each router will make decisions based only on the information available in the attached links but it doesn't care about the rest of the network right? um, but that means also that the packets may not travel through the shortest path or the min minimum cost so imagine a packet is sent from N2 randomly to N4 it's supposed to go to N6 but 4 send it randomly to N1 N1 send it randomly to N3 N3 send it randomly to N4 N4 send it randomly to N5 N5 send it to N6 so the packet has traveled way longer than it should but that's the that's the price we pay for using this random routing how do we do this by the way why why are we doing all of these sounds like silly techniques right well again there is always a trade-off if I want to know exactly all the information about the network before I send anything it will the I need to write complicated software Right? but these techniques will allow us to do routing with very minimum software required and that allows the routers to be very simple devices right so there is a trade-off you want complexity or you want uh, um, cheapness or ch or a cheap cheap approach right so the most complex of all these strategies is the adaptive routing and this is what most of our life as network engineers are spent on these routers and you see a lot of people talking about all of these routers or routing techniques and study them and spend time on uh, looking at their characteristics and all of that these are the most uh, complex techniques but they also allow us to um, achieve the, the maximum performance so packets in general using adaptive technique uh, are sent through the least cost path and also because of these techniques are adaptive when part of the network is damaged or fail these 
techniques will allow us to choose the next best least cost path and so on so we always adapt and we change the routing to to according to the conditions of the network so initially we could say well the best route between a and b is through this path here but what if this link fails or sometimes failure not necessarily that the link is cut but it's just congested too much that you cannot send anything through it anymore so now the network could pick the second best route so here the route count one one and two is four what is the second best so i could for example send it through um two three one and six so that will cost about five six units instead of four units right so that the network will adapt and will say okay so one link failed let's try a different link and that will happen by the network itself no decisions made by the administrator and they the administrator just configure the network once and let it work now as i said you pay the price the price is the complexity the other techniques that we saw they don't need a very complicated software flooding for example that doesn't need anything just flood the packet maybe monitor the number of uh, the number on the on the packet itself so if the packet is seen again drop it don't forward it so that's simple or use the number of hubs the random strategy also doesn't need either one of these techniques just send it randomly to any link but all of these techniques uh, have drawbacks simple but they may not be the most efficient adaptive routing most efficient but it's not simple in in build in writing or in the protocol itself right and another issue we face with this adaptive routing is how adaptive the routing should be so in other words if i make the network too adaptive so as soon as this link gets congested i start sending the packets through another link so immediately oh um, i have the response here is slow i cannot send packets so let's go through another route immediately right then the the link here could be temporarily congested but then goes back to normal so now the network has to adapt again and send the packet back or send the subsequent packets back to the the to the initial route if i make the network too adaptive then we will have oscillation what does it mean it means that a packet comes this way now of course as soon as i start sending packets through this route it will become a little bit more congested than before right so i say oh this route now is more congested than this one so i'm going to send my packets here immediately right and then by doing this this route the second route become congested so i'm going to go back to the first so i'll start us oscillating between one and the other quickly that the packets or the network becomes unstable all right okay the other approach is being slow if we are being too slow so the the packet is sent through the first path one to four four to five five to six but 
uh, traffic encounters congestion or a link fails altogether and the router say no 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 I'm not gonna change anything I'm just gonna wait if I wait too long it may have an adverse effect on the network what happens if the packets are traveling through a route but they are congested they may be dropped or if the link fails they may be dropped because the routers do not know how to forward them so um, so the trade-off that we have to make is to make sure that the adaptive part is neither too quick or no, or nor too slow somewhere in between how to manage that usually we manage that by using timers right so when a router um, sees a failure in in a link it doesn't especially if the link is not intermediate is not immediate link it's something far away it doesn't immediately say oh i'm gonna change the route no it waits for a few for a certain amount of time and then declares that okay this route is no longer available i'm gonna choose another one so during that time it could be a temporary um, disconnection or a temper, a temper, a, a, um, a, a, um, like a short term failure and then goes back to normal. So, if that happens, then we don't have to make any change. Okay, so how can we make it adaptive? again there are several strategies we could make the routing adaptive but only using information available to the to the router itself so we'll use local information so we don't care about the rest of the network we just see local information all right we could also rely on information from adjacent nodes the adjacent nodes can be distributed or can be centralized right so we talked about that before so we have overlapping of ideas here so if i want so what what it means to have adjacent nodes so the routers will collaborate among each other they will share information about which links are available which what is the bandwidth in each link what is the delay on each link and collaboratively they decide on the best routes they could also use a centralized location so each router will not share information with everybody but will share information with a controller here so they will send information to the controller Each router will say, here is the situation that I see. I see link to N3 with a cost of 5. I see a link to N2 with a cost of 2. And I see a link to N4 with a cost of 1. So they will send the information to the controller. The controller do all the calculations, so to speak, and send back, oh, node 1. So your best route to network 6 is through N4. Um, node 2, your best route to node 6 is send data to node 4 as well, right? So the controller will decide. And then finally, we have the last strategy, which is receiving information from all nodes right so actually the adjacent nodes and all nodes make a big difference in how the network achieve stable routing right and these will these two actually are known to be uh, two distinct routing strategies that we use today especially the distributed part not the centralized okay so let's take 
the examples of um, the local isolated um, information here. So imagine node 4, which in our case here, right? So it has four different links, right? So node 4 in the isolated strategy, it doesn't share information with anybody else. It just looks at its own um, links here. So if um, a packet arrive, so we have a packet here comes and it's supposed to go to node 6 and it's shown here by the 2 6 here. So I have now four options. I can send it to node 1 again. I can send it to node 2. I can send it to node 3 or I can send it to node 5. Which node to send? So one of the metrics that node 4 can use is how congested the links are. And how do I know how congested the links are? By looking at how many packets are waiting to be transmitted in each link. So node, the link to node 1 has two packets waiting to be transmitted on the other direction, right? And to 2, I have three nodes waiting, three packets waiting. To node three, I have one packet waiting. And to node five, I have five packets waiting. So node four says, okay, so based on this information, I'm gonna send it to node three. Why? Because it has the least, the packet will encounter the least amount of delay. It has only one packet ahead of it in the queue while it has more packets ahead of it in the other links. So I'm gonna send it to node three because it will encounter the least cost, the least delay. All right, so that's adaptive routing. Why? Because these um, queue lengths change over time. And the assumption is uh, they will change depends on the status of the network. So if node five is busy, the queue here would be longer and longer and longer, right? So if I don't add to it, then eventually these packets will go and this link will be available again. Right? So this will make routing adaptive. Um, okay. Um, Another way to manipulate, let's say I know that, yes, there are more packets here waiting to node 5, but actually this the link to node 5 has more bandwidth. So I would prefer that I'm going to give a bias. I'm going to give some bias to this node and other nodes. So I'll influence the decision a little bit. So the bias here given by the administrator is bias 9 to node 1, bias 6 to node 2, and bias 3 to node um, 3, and bias 0 to node 5. So what does the bias mean? means that um, when I look at when the node look at five here, it says five plus bias, which is zero, so that's five. Here, one, node three, one plus three, that's four. And three plus six, that's nine. And two plus nine, that's 11. So now the number in the queue, the number of packets in the queue is not enough or is not used alone to determine where to send the packets, but I add to it the bias. So because of the bias here, now obviously the bias to five is the lowest. So I prefer 
uh, or I'll give preference to sending to the node 5. But in this particular case, uh, packets coming to be sent to 6. So here 5 plus 0 is 5, and here 1 plus 3 is 4. So this one has still, even with the bias, it still has a lower number. So still node 4 will send the packet to node 3. So remember, is the bias is the number that I add to the actual number of the packets in the queue to influence the decision. And in this case, I am preferring or I'm giving priority to node 5 because it has the lowest bias. And then the next priority is to node 3. And then the next priority is node 6. And the next priority is node 1. So node 4 will not send anything to node 1 unless all of the other links are really, really busy. Uh, they have more than nine packets waiting. That's when node one becomes possible. Okay, so that's uh, based on local information only. So that's what we talked about. So let's talk about the based on information from other sources. And I said here we have either adjacent nodes or finally information from all nodes. So one famous strategy, routing strategy, is called distance vector routing. So what is the distance here in the distance vector? The distance is um, as similar to the cost. We said I said earlier that the cost may not be actual money cost, but the cost is representing either delay or bandwidth or some other metric. Distance is the same thing. When we say distance, we don't mean distance in meters or kilometers. We mean a certain a certain metric. So the distance could be an actual number of uh, an actual distance, which affects the propagation delay. It could be Distance refers to the number of hops, the number of jumps. It could be the distance is the queue, the number of packets in the queue, like here. Or it could be a bandwidth. In that case, the higher the bandwidth, the lower the distance. So it's inversely proportional, right? So, and one of them. Um, what we will discuss in these slides is the Q length as the distance. But one of the famous and most, um, uh, or actually one of the first routing protocols in the internet is RIP protocol. And the RIP protocol uses the number of hops, the number of jumps as the distance, right? So the concept is the same, just now we're talking about the Q length as the metric. So in this example, or how the distance vector routing works, it works by each router will gather information uh, or will share information, which means send and also receive information with its immediate neighbors. So N1 will share its information about its Q length, the Q length inside it, to other immediate nodes. So N1 has Q length. So periodically, every few milliseconds, it will send the information to other links, other, other nodes. And these other nodes will share information with their other nodes, and but only the immediate nodes. So make like remember this part, only the immediate nodes. So N1 will send information to immediate nodes, N2 sends information to immediate nodes, and so on. And eventually, each one of these nodes will build 
its routing table based on the information that it gathers from its immediate nodes. So here is an example where initially um, node 1 has a, a list of destinations 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and it has the delay that it, it require it is required to 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 reach the next node so to reach itself of course the delay is zero to reach two the delay is two to reach three the delay is five and to reach four the delay is one and so on right that's when it starts and then it sends some formation to its immediate neighbors which is two three and four and the intermediate nodes or the immediate neighbors i mean they will send information to to n1 as well so they will exchange information so after looking at all the information node one says okay I can go to node 3 directly, but it will cost me or the delay will be 5. But how about if I send it to 3 first or to 2 first? So sending it to 2 first will cost me 2, but from 3 to 3, um, it will from 2 to 3 will cost me 3 additional 3. So the cost to two first is two and the cost from two to three is three so the total cost is five that doesn't help me much because i'm still it doesn't give me any better advantage so how about i send it to uh well sending it to three directly will cost also five so there is no advantage how about to send the information the packet to four and then use four to send it to three is there an advantage all right if i send it to four first the delay is one and then four the delay it will send it to three with a delay of two so one and two is three that's better than five so i'm gonna adjust my routing table here so instead of sending traffic to 3 directly, I'm sending it to 4. And then 4 will send it to the destination. So that will actually lower the cost or lower the delay of travel from 5 to 3. You'll see here, initially, the delay is marked with a circle. And then the later... Uh, the square represents or the rectangle represents the the better delay right so the better delay from five to instead of sending the information from five or, or two five to through three i'm gonna send the information two five through four instead because the total delay will be reduced okay so that's the strategy Remember here is the strategy uh, depends on exchanging information only with the neighbors. So how does a router get a full picture of the entire network? How does node 1 knows how to send packet to node 6? Node 6 is not an, intermediate, uh, it's not an immediate neighbor. So how does it know about it? It knows about it because the neighbor knows about it. So N1 doesn't know about N6 directly. It knows about N6 because N3 tells it that, oh, I have information about N node 6. So this is what I call a gossip strategy. As instead of the gossip strategy, uh, I call it this way because rather than listening to the news directly from the source, right? So you are listening to the news from somebody else right so imagine i provide or i give an announcement to the class 
but instead of listening to my announcement or reading my email or listening to the recording directly you are asking a friend of yours who is taking the same class and say what did he say so he will say well he did he said this and this and that now there are two implications of this strategy the first one is there is a delay instead of listening to me directly you are listening to the you are waiting for another person to listen to me and then provides you with the information so that there is a delay another consequence of that is you may not get the most recent information you may get actually wrong information right so that happens in distance vector in distance vector it one of the implications is that we may end up uh, with node 3 for example saying that if you won't reach node 6 you can go this way and share this information with everybody else but then something happens to node to this link and it fails so N1 says, okay, anybody has a link to node 6? So node 4 will say, yes, yes, I have a, a link. I have a route to node 6. It goes through this route, 3, 5 to 6. Even though actually this link failed. So how did that happen? Well, it happened because node 4 maybe send the information to node 1 before it gets updated about the recent failure in the link so there are so many scenarios that um, cause this some of them probably will talk about them in a different course altogether um, but uh, suffice to say that in this course we are uh, looking at this distance vector strategy as one of the common strategies but it's not full proof as I always say there's something um, there is a trade-off between the accuracy um, and the perform or uh, the trade-off between the complexity and the performance and in this case we are limiting ourselves to listening only to the neighbors and the drawback is the network may not respond quickly to any change right? and the further away the change is the slower it gets to the node so if node 1 notice a change in the immediate links here it will know about them immediately but if the change is far away in the link between n3 and n6 for example or actually worse between 5 and 6 it will take time for 5 to inform 3 and 4 and 3 will inform 1 and no one will know about it. right so the other alternative is this final one here where the node makes the decision based on information from all nodes and we will call this the link state routing so um, the strategy depends on a different metric so instead of looking at the number of hops or the queue the queue by the way as the slides say the queue it may not be a good representation of the delay right so the delay the, the queue could be long not because the link is has a delay but because maybe the router itself is slow in processing some packets right? so as i said the distance vector not necessarily there is the rip protocol that's used in the internet doesn't require delay it's actually it doesn't require queue length it's actually uses the number of hops right but it's still considered a distance vector right but it uses the number of hops which means that to the best path from n1 to n6 depends on how many 
halves travel so here we have we can go either one to three three to six or we can go one to four four to five five to six so in actual rip protocol routing information protocol the number of halves is the only metric used so n1 will choose one to three three to six to pass packets right link state routing it uses another metric which could be the actual delay in the link itself it could be bandwidth so the metric itself is what i mean by the cost or the distance right so some protocols will use delay some protocols will use bandwidth uh, and of course we prefer the lowest delay or the highest bandwidth right so if i am measuring the bandwidth as my metric then the higher the bandwidth is the best the better the link is it's inverse inverse proportional if i am looking at delay then the lower the delay is the better the link right but the most important aspect of the link state routing is that the routing decisions are made after we collect information from all nodes not just the neighbors all nodes so each router will try to talk to all the nodes in the network collects the information and then starts calculating the best route that actually makes this routing technique better or more stable and more adaptive to the changes in the network so if we use the delay then each node will use an average delay so the delay has to be calculated over time otherwise it will be oscillating so it will it will average so how does what do we mean by the delay is it just the propagation delay no the delay is a combination of the propagation delay which is a physical property and also um, the num the time a packet is processed contributed to the delay and the frame time to send the frame also contribute to the delay so um, so the delay is calculated one of the techniques to calculate the delay is to send the packet and waits for the acknowledgement and then calculate the round trip time so I send the packet and I received an acknowledgement what is the time spent between sending the packet and receiving the acknowledgement so I store that then I send another packet and another packet and every time I monitor the round round trip and take the average and that will represent the delay so that's one of the techniques we use so this information is exchanged between all the routers and then we use something called dextra algorithm the dextra algorithm is used for the link state protocol and for the distance vector we use a protocol called bellman ford right so uh, so two different algorithms used for two different routing strategies or technique all right so we will visit the Dexter algorithm at the end uh, but for now let's say I picked one or two of these routing or any of these routing techniques um, and we remember we are talking about the internet or internetworks and this is what we are trying to study the network that is composed of multiple networks uh, each one of these smaller networks is under a different administration right. um, so we cannot ex ex expect that all of these 
networks agree on one routing protocol or one routing strategy. So now we have the concept of routing information that is local and routing information that needs to be shared with other networks. Also, and this is actually the slide that's in front of me right now, uh, we have the concept of, we said here that we have something called the Dextra algorithm and Bellman Ford algorithm. So what are these algorithms and how do they play a role in our routing? So if I want to visit this topic, um, we when we talk about layer three so we have the physical data link and the ip network we saw that here we have multiple concepts actually in in that are implemented in uh, layer three the first one we saw it before is the addressing so IP layer or network layer is responsible for managing the route or figuring out the path between these two nodes, right? So it needs to know how to forward packets. So the first thing we need to know is the address before I send any mail. I have to put an address on the envelope. So addressing is one of the functions of the IP layer. Addressing is not unique because we need addressing here as well. So it's not unique to the IP layer, but it is one of the functions of the IP layer. The other function is how to figure out the routing. How to find the route in order to find the route we need two things for adaptive routing right we need to exchange information among the, the routers themselves so one technique is to exchange information how do we exchange information do we use flooding to the entire network do we just share information among the neighbors only do we share information with all nodes in the network do we share information with a centralized controller so that's the part in the routing protocol is concerned about sharing information the other part is if I have this information now, how do I extract the best route from that from that information? So that's where the algorithms are. So with the distance vector algorithm, the information we share is among the neighbors only. So N1 shares information with N2, N4, and N3 because these are the neighbors. But then how to calculate the best route we use the uh, Bellman Ford algorithm. With the, the link state, we share information with all uh, nodes, and then we use something called Dextra act algorithm to calculate. So you have to differentiate between the mechanism by which we share information and also the mechanism by which we make or we calculate the shortest path. Okay. So the algorithms, they make the routing decisions while the routers exchange information um, among, them, among themselves and the information is the metric, right? So we use information about the topology, about the delays, about the bandwidth, all of this. <coughs> All right, so remember I mentioned 
the idea that we have a lot of networks and we cannot expect them to all agree on the same protocol so the network the internet actually made of multiple networks and the structure is complex so Dalhousie has its own network um, 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 let's say the government has its own network um, another college has its own network um, there are ISPs that they connect some of these networks to um, you have a, a network at home that's your home network all of these networks need to be connected to each other but Dalhousie may use one routing protocol the government may use another routing protocol so how do we if we want to connect these networks together how can we connect them do we force everybody to use the same routing that's impossible do we even if they use the same routing protocol they may not agree to the same metric so I may use OSPF or this uh, an example of a link state protocol but I may adjust my metrics differently than others so the next concept we learn is the idea of autonomous system so each one of these networks that fall under a different administration we call it autonomous system which simply a network doesn't matter how big but the network that falls under one administrator right so Dalhousie network under one administrator uh, Nova Scotia government network is an, a different administrator the college network is a different as administrator a hospital network in it under a different administrator and so on so when i look at the network from this perspective i could say that i can divide my routing into routing protocols into two categories one category we call it the interior routing or interior router protocol or irp or igp sometimes um, so interior gateway protocol so this protocol is responsible for routing within the network itself so if i look at this and if this network is consists of multiple routers here connected in some fashion so the irp is responsible for routing traffic among this network but if it needs to connect to the outside to other uh, autonomous systems then we have to use something called exterior routing protocol so we need to use a different routing strategy or a different router protocol so here this is a an example of two autonomous systems this this set of routers will exchange routing information among themselves with using one of the strategies that we discussed even flooding for example doesn't matter and this autonomous system uses a different routing strategy but then when we connect these two autonomous systems together we have to use exterior router router protocol the exterior router protocol is designed so that it doesn't care about the delay or about the details I should say in the in the inside network so from the exterior routing protocol perspective it looks at the network as so it ignores all the details and so if I want to do it 
so there is a router here and a router here and a router here and these routers they share information among themselves about how to forward packets between the autonomous systems so they form their own network among themselves and in that case these routers they don't care about let's say Dalhousie uh, you are sitting at Dalhousie in a, a Dalhousie lab and you want to send something through this um, network here uh, it, your packet may travel across multiple routers inside Dalhousie then goes to this router and this router forwards it through to another autonomous system so there are multiple routers inside this college and then multiple routers inside this another system these green routers that participate in the exterior exterior routing protocols they don't care about the how the packets travel inside each one of these networks they don't all they care about is if i want to send packet from dalhousie to this network here i have to send it using these hops how they travel inside each network that's not my business that's the interior routing protocol business okay so what kind of strategy these exterior routing protocols use do they use distance vector do they use link state do they use another um, strategy well it turns out a link state um, is not it doesn't work right imagine the entire link state as i said it needs that all the routers share information among themselves before they uh, calculate the best route so if i want to use exterior routing protocol i use the link state and exterior routing protocol this means that every router here every autonomous system here in canada has to share information with everybody in china or us or um, iran or um, india or and it's, it's impossible it's not it's not manageable distance vector um, also may not be good because that means that um, the time to propagate the information takes a long time and also this means that all routers have to agree on certain metric so even if i use distance vector means that all the routers in the world have to agree on using the hub count as the metric or using the queue delay as a metric also not possible so the strategy that exterior routing protocol use is something called bath vector routing and in the bath vector routing each router here keeps information or saves information about how many or the information about autonomous systems needed to reach uh, a destination so autonomous systems have to be numbered to be useful so autonomous system uh, one autonomous system three autonomous system two autonomous system uh, seven five autonomous system nine autonomous system eight autonomous system six right so they have to be numbered and let's say i want to send something from one autonomous system to another using um, erp so in that case uh, these routing information routers will exchange path vector among themselves so uh, for example autonomous system 2 sends information to others that says if you want to want if you want to reach 9 
you have to go through me right so that's my path and it shares information with autonomous system 3 autonomous system 3 says okay if I want to share if you tells everybody else if you want to go to 9 right so you have to go through me first then 2 then 9 and it shares, it shares information among other routers as well so autonomous system 1 it says okay if I want to reach 9 I can go from 1 to 3 to 2 to 9 but I can also go from 1 to 7 to 6 to 8 to 9 and I can also go from 1 to 3 to 5 to 9 so I have multiple paths I will choose the shortest path here now the shortest path is relative to autonomous systems right so this ASP could have 100 routers in the middle and this one has only three routers in the middle but still from the exterior routing protocol it will consider this path shorter than this path right it just doesn't care about how complex the network inside is so we will call this a path vector and autonomous systems will choose how to forward to their destination based on by default the shortest path but there is an advantage to this right so obviously the disadvantage is we are hiding the details one autonomous system may be too big another autonomous system may be small this information is hidden uh, and also there is no information about the actual bandwidth or the cost or any of that it just will, will look at autonomous system as just one block but the advantage is we can have policy routing so let's say autonomous system one looks at all of these paths and others as well and the administrator says you know what um, I don't want any traffic to go through net autonomous system 5 I don't want any traffic to go through this so traffic is not allowed to go through autonomous system 5 so now all the paths are remaining are the ones that don't go through 5 and now we can choose which one among these is the shortest and we forward the traffic through it right so this is possible as well right. so we can do policy routing we can do policy routing based on a lot of things based on po politics for example I don't want any traffic that originated from Canada to go through the US because they will probably the US government will look at the traffic and will sniff it and will figure it so nothing goes through the US right so that could be a policy I could be a policy that I am connected through two ISPs ISP1 here and ISP2 here and this one charges more every time I send traffic here it charges me more and I'm sitting at home here or I'm sitting at um, maybe a company right and I want to choose the route that will cost me less money actual money right so even though I have multiple routes to, to reach Dalhousie but I will choose the route that will cost me less money and maybe if the one with the less money has a failure maybe I'll switch to the other one right? so it allows me to do policy routing 
Um, as I mentioned before, we're going to discuss Dextra algorithm again. So actually, because this is a slightly separate topic and seems like it comes at the end, so what I will do is talk about Dextra algorithm and how to calculate the path in a separate recording. So at this point, I will just stop here and I will talk about the Dextra algorithm in a separate recording later. So for now, thank you and uh, I'll see you in a different, in another recording.